So as Zach said, I'm from DeepMind's Applied Group, um, where I work on a team that applies DeepMind's research to machine learning and reinforcement learning, um, DeepMind's research in machine learning and reinforcement learning to Google's products. Uh, today, I'm going to briefly talk to you about why we chose to use TensorFlow, how we use it, and how, it ha how it's helped us. So the choice of a numerical computing platform such as TensorFlow is incredibly important to us. It's how we express our ideas, and it's the piece of, the piece of software our engineers and scientists spend most of their time interacting with. Um, the quality of that platform has a direct and significant effect on the quality of our work and the speed with which we can deliver results. Um, and there are several aspects to what we look for in that. So from flexibility, um, our researchers continue to concoct all these weird and wonderful networks um, which we're hoping to put into use. Usability. Um, using this platform has to be easy and natural. Simple things like getting some embeddings and passing them th through a feed-forward network have to be trivial. Composing things should be easy. We should be able to take all these components which people, people are developing and knock them together to create new things. We need to be able to reach into the guts of that network to see what it's doing. And we need tools for visualizing and debugging what's going on. The platform also has to be scalable. Um, we see this move uh, towards increasingly more data, increasingly larger networks trained on more powerful accelerators across multiple servers. And the more that trend continues, the better. We need to be performant. So training, com uh, training machine learning models is the new compile link cycle. It often takes days or even weeks for us to get results, which reduces the speed with which we can iterate and try new things. Um, so the faster it goes, the faster we can develop. It's also important at serve time where latency is a critical factor in what we can do. Um, we often have quite, la quite tight latency boundaries. Um, the more performant the model is, the more expressive and more computationally powerful models we can use, which will give us bigger accuracy gains. Also with training, um, performance matters because <laughs> when we're training on real data at serve time, the speed with which we can train affects the freshness of the model which often has downstream effects on our accuracy at serve time. And finally, production readiness. Um, we often spend all this time doing research and evaluation and experimentation of our models, and when we finally come up with a good thing, we want to get it into production as soon as possible to do live experiments and, and ultimately scale it up to all the traffic that we have. So previously at DeepMind, our projects were all implemented in either torch or disbelief. As TensorFlow began to mature and head towards its first open source release, we started looking at it as, as an interesting thing. Um, in the applied group, we began experimenting with it by trying a few new projects. Meanwhile, the research team, who have this very stable, much used code base they needed to think about, began by um, carefully evaluating the suitability by re-implementing several existing projects. Based on the results of that, we decided that TensorFlow was the way forward, and so we started to migrate. Um, so over the past year or so, we've been working on that process, and as of today, most of our code that we currently use is in TensorFlow, and all the stuff, oh, the significant amount of stuff we're building from now on will be in TensorFlow. Um, what's quite cool about this is we made this decision a year, a year and a half ago, and since then, the TensorFlow and the ecosystem around it has improved beyond our expectations. So we're even more happy with this decision now than we were then. So I'm going to spend the rest of my time talking a bit more specifically about how we use TensorFlow and how it helps us. And since I'm from the applied group, I'll start there. So one of the coolest things we've done recently is on optimizing the energy usage in Google's data centers. This began when the technical infrastructure team came to us after seeing the AlphaGo matches and wondered how we could use RL to control the data centers more efficiently. So we worked with them, and we worked with, and subsequently we worked with teams in Google Brain to build models um, to control the cooling infrastructure. Um, briefly, this is what a cold aisle in one of Google's data center looks like. This is um, the servers. Some of them maybe are running TensorFlow, and they're getting hot doing so. So we have these fans at the back which pull that cold air over the servers into this hot aisle where it travels down and is transferred into a water cooling system. <coughs> so here are some pipes and some pumps. And the pipes take the hot water from the hot aisle to the chillers on the roof and the cold water from those chillers back to the cold aisle. 
And here's what those cooling towers look like. They're just big fans which take the water and cool it down into the air. So we spent a while working on this offline. We had to take into account um, safety. We, the model couldn't go and try random things. Uh, otherwise, we'd break you know, billion dollar data centers, which is never great. Um, and we had to work out how to do a bit of exploration as well, because if we just learned on the data which um, we had available, the model would probably never learn to do anything more optimal than what um, the human operators had done. Um, so we iterated a bit, and when it eventually came time to experiment, uh, we turned it on and we saw this nice drop. Um, from my experience, it's kind of rare to see something so defined and sustained like this, so we were quite happy with it. Um, so we had this initial result, and it came time to implement it. Um, because the data centers didn't really have um, the infrastructure set up to run and train and evaluate and verify um, machine learning models, we had to write a lot of this ourselves. Um, so we did that. We, we took our original Torch models and moved them to TensorFlow. We built up all this training and validation and serving stuff. Um, but over the past year, what we've witnessed is a rise, uh, a development in these higher level APIs around TensorFlow and components like TensorFlow Serving, which basically negate a lot of the work that we had to do. Um, which from our perspective is great, because we'd rather focus on the modeling aspects than all this kind of infrastructure stuff. Um, cool. So another example where TensorFlow helped us is we previously had this system called Gorilla, which stands for General Reinforcement Learning Architecture, with some extra letters thrown in there. Um, and we wrote this initially to speed up training of DQN style agents. So what this was, was a framework built on top of disbelief. Um, we had the parameters of an agent stored across multiple parameter servers and multiple instances of that agent pulling the parameters from that parameter server and interacting with environments to get experience. That experience was then stored in a distributed memory where multiple learners sampled from it to make updates to the model parameters and the whole thing kind of cycled around like that. Um, by doing it this way, we could get more experience faster because we had multiple agents, and we could learn faster because we had multiple learners. Um, but often more than um, speed of convergence, we often saw that sometimes these models actually did better than models trained on single servers, and we think that had something to do with um, the breaking of correlations between the examples we trained on from time to time. Um, this also was one of the inspirations for the A3C training algorithm, which our researchers later developed. Um, so with the introduction of TensorFlow, we were able to basically deprecate this um, because much of the functionality is handled by TensorFlow or can be written from within TensorFlow, um, which is great because it's more time, less time we need to spend on code and maintaining it and more time we can spend on our actual projects. Um, more generally, since we've started using TensorFlow, we've seen a reduction across the board in the amount of ancillary work we have to perform and things are only getting better as TensorFlow and the ecosystem around it continues to develop. Um, so one of these is the high-level APIs which are developing, which take care of a lot of the work we previously had to do to start a new project, to build a prototype, to train it and evaluate it, meaning we can spend more time on modeling. Um, it's easy to experiment with models in TensorFlow. Um, it's, it's easy to put together a baseline and a couple lines of code. It's easy to... Um, change things about it. So, for example, if we have a bunch of embeddings from various time series, do we want to concatenate the last 10 of them together? Do we want to convolve over them? Do we want to pass them through an LSTM to get the state? Um, it's all just a couple lines of changes, which is quite nice. Um, the distributed training helps us. Um, we can try more things quicker and sooner. Um, and finally, once we've gone through all this work and we're excited and wanting to put them all into production, TF serving kind of gets rid of a lot of the pain that was previously there. Um, so all this amounts to a quicker develop, de development cycle, meaning we can support more projects, we can experiment more, and we can deliver quicker, which is great. Um, and what's more, we've yet to come across an instance in any of these collaborations with Google where TensorFlow has not been suited to the problem we're working on, hasn't been flexible enough, which is great. Um, so I'm excited about the possibilities here, and I hope we can tell you more about some of these projects soon. 
So the applied team is only one part of DeepMind, and our friends in research are also busy doing lots of cool stuff um, and have begun to take advantage of TensorFlow to do so. Um, so one of the obvious things and one of the most exciting moments for us last year was when AlphaGo succeeded in a series of matches against Isidol, one of the greatest Go players of the last decade. What made this so exciting was it was a combination of a great technical achievement in making a strong Go player, but it also represented something of a new beginning in the game of Go. Um, interest boomed, uh, Go boards sold out across the world, <laughs> which is interesting. Um, and players responded not with a sense of defeat, but they were excited about it as a new beginning because they could work with these machines to explore more deeply the mysteries of this ancient game. Um, more to the point, AlphaGo is one of the first significant user, uses of TensorFlow at DeepMind, where it was used to great advantage to train these networks, powering AlphaGo. <coughs> so I won't spend too much time talking about Go itself. Just suffice to say, it's a perfect information game with a very high branching factor and a lot of moves in a, a particular game. Um, so your standard minimax search obviously won't work. Um, what the main component of AlphaGo was composed of these two networks, a policy network and a value network. The policy network was trained to, given a game state, work out which move the opponent was going to make. And the value network was trained to, given a game state, how likely, tr predict how likely we were to win that game. So naively, while you could just use the value network to evaluate your next set of moves, in practice that wasn't quite good enough for what we needed. So we resulted to a bit of a compromise using a combination of using these nets with a Monte Carlo tree search to get better results. Um, and the way this basically works is if you do a full Monte Carlo search, that's way too many possibilities. So we use this um, policy network to guide the paths in this search tree to the most likely um, paths. And then at some point further on in one of those paths, we'd use the value network to evaluate how good that path was, meaning we didn't have to go all the way to the end. Um, why the value network performed better in that case is because as we unrolled these paths, um, more of the game had unfolded and things were more so certain, so the value network had a better prediction. Um, but the real thing where TensorFlow came in was the training of this thing, um, which was quite a significant, uh, it took quite a significant amount of work. So we started by taking games from expert players and training this policy network, and then we began this iterative process where we use reinforcement learning to train a value network from that policy network and then update the policy network to produce better moves. Um, previously, doing this on Torch, it was slow. And when we moved to TensorFlow, we were able to bring the whole power of distributed training uh, to bear on this, which made it the whole thing faster and meant our researchers could iterate quicker and try new things. Another cool thing um, from this year was WaveNet. Uh, which we use to re generate realistic audio signals. Um, so this is hard in general because sound waves are this complex, have this complex oscillating structure with a very high sampling rate on the order of 16 kilohertz. Um, generating an audio signal requires a model which is able to reproduce this sort of signal at both a very, um, f both these very fine-grained oscillations on the order of milliseconds and the whole signal over seconds, um, which is difficult because of the amount of information. Um, so there were two main approaches to this previously, uh, concatenative models and parametric models. So a concatenative model worked by having a speaker say a whole bunch of sound and chopping it up into little bits and then reassembling those to say whatever you wanted. Um, what, we often what you often see from these is the sound seems kind of choppy because these transitions between these sound segments don't quite match up. Um, it's also difficult to modify the voice either adding a new speaker or altering the emphasis or emotion. Um, similarly, the, the other approach was parametric models, of which WaveNet is one, where all the information required to generate speech is stored in the parameters of the model, and you supply um, information about what you want to say and the characteristics of that um, as inputs to the model. Um, however, Prior to WaveNet, uh, we noticed that parametric text-to-speech had tended to sound a bit less natural than concatenative models. Um, so WaveNet changes the paradigm that was um, previously in um, parametric models um, by directly mod modeling the waveform 
of the audio signal one sample at a time. Uh, so as well as yielding more natural sounding speech, by directly modeling the raw wave for form, it means that WaveNet can produce any kind of audio, not just speech. Um, so the architecture for this evolved out of work on pixel RNNs and pixel CNNs, which were used for generating images. And the key piece of architecture here was the use of a <coughs> dilation, um, a, delayed, a dilated convolution uh, with an increasing, uh, an, an exponentially increasing stride as the layers um, increased. What this allowed the model to do was to have a receptor field size that was exponential in the number of the layers in the model, which allowed it to incorporate all this inf information about the signal. The other cool thing about this structure is that it, um, uh, in the first half of the input compared to the second half, uh, there are twice the number of uh, connections, meaning it, uh, it, it, it uses that information to a greater degree. Um, so here are some samples generated uh, from the various systems. So on the left, we have uh, audio from a concatenative model. Should we can play? The left one, yeah. The Blue Lagoon is a 1980 American romance and adventure film directed by Randall Kleiser. Um, so if you listen closely, you can s perceive some of the discontinuities um, in the generated audio due to the slight mismatches in the transitions between the different recorded chunks. Um, so in the middle, we have a parametric The Blue Lagoon model, is a 1980 American romance and adventure film directed by Randall Kleiser. Which is less choppy, but it doesn't have that natural quality um, we associate with normal speech. And so and finally, we have WaveNet. The Blue Lagoon is a 1980 American romance and adventure film directed by Randall Kleiser which compared to the other two is, is very smooth and natural. Um, the only slight thing that WaveNet does is it has a bit of noise due to the sampling procedure and, and the neural network. Um, so maybe if we play them all again, just so people can see here. From, yeah, just from left to right. Okay. You want to play them again? Yeah, okay. thanks. The Blue Lagoon is a 1980 American romance and adventure film directed by Randall Kleiser. The Blue Lagoon is a 1980 American romance and adventure film directed by Randall Kleiser. The Blue Lagoon is a 1980 American ro Thanks. <laughs> um, so we compared WaveNet against other models um, through the use of opinion scores and what we found uh, by human raters and what we found was that it narrowed the gap to human speech by about 50%, which is great. Um, and because WaveNet models uh, they model the raw audio signal, we can also get it to produce sound other than speech. So here's an example where we trained it on a corpus of classical music. Thanks. As you can hear, it's able to generate... Ooh, go back one. Yeah, thanks. Um, as you can hear, it's able to generate realistic sounding piano notes um, on a moment to moment basis. Um, and finally, uh, with what must be one of my favorite paper titles of the year, uh, Learning to Learn by Gradient Descent, by Gradient Descent, um, in which some of our researchers trained a neural network to train a neural network, um, which I think is a great example of the kind of flexibility that TensorFlow offers. Um, and I think going forward, we're going to see more of this kind of crazy out there stuff. Um, like with models, learning architectures of models, models adding bits and pieces to themselves and so on. Um, and so it's exciting to see that TensorFlow uh, can handle that. Um, and I know, at least from us at DeepMind, that TensorFlow is, is going to be our choice of how we model these things going forward. So if you're interested in more details, you can look at our website, deepmind.com. Um, there's a blog post linked here, which uh, rounds up some of the things from last year. Um, and we also have links to the over 100 papers that we've published so far. Um, thanks for listening.